So um, I carry it with me because if it's not with me, if it's in the car and I'm on the hill for two hours, that's not good. Um, and as, as far as that kind of thing goes, uh, my friend was in the Air Force, took survival training, and he said water is the number one thing. Gatorade and those kind of drinks are second. Pop, coffee, alcoholic drinks, uh, they'll all dehydrate you more. Even though you think you're you know, getting your thirst quenched and all that. Uh, the advertising may tell you that, but it's not true in reality. You can have that when you're done, you go home and have whatever type of beverage you'd like. But uh, during the day, you need to drink a lot of water. So, uh, the hammer again. I mentioned I dig footholds with this. And I got the extra long handle one. I found out too that, that uh, if, you, if it's not too heavy for you, the, uh, uh, you get a lot more leverage. Rarely, rarely do I hit a rock with this. This is not a chipping tool. Uh, in our area, the best thing you can do with this is use it as an anchor. And stick it in those steep hillsides and hang on to it and keep it from falling down. Uh, so I use it for that more than anything. Now, you, know, you can use it at uh, this end as a hammer with, with a chisel. And I have found with my aim, this kind of chisel's best. <laughs> uh, but if you're going to do any rock whacking, whether it's with this or with a chisel, you need to have safety glasses. And I didn't bring, bring any up here tonight, but I think you can all imagine what that is. Um, I was collecting with someone years ago who uh, had a hammer and was a new collector. And, was whacking on rocks and got a stone chip, hit her in the eye, and cut her cornea. So she had a patch on her eye for a week, whatever. It hurt like the devil. So that's not a good thing. But anyway, as far as that, uh, what other stuff can we possibly have in here that we may need is a crack hammer. And that and this is basically how you chisel things out. Uh, in our area, fossils are like beach collecting. They're just laying out there. Uh, this is unusual for, uh, in our area because of that. Some other areas aren't, aren't that uh, prevalent uh, where you do have to use these kind of tools to get the fossils out or to make things smaller. There are occasions when you might want to do that. I had a, uh, uh, one collecting site up at Cowan Lake. I found it was a slab of rock this big, about that thin, a quarter inch in diameter, very small. So I had to use a chisel and a hammer. But, uh, the best way to do it is just peck, peck, peck around it, around it, around it, around it, and hope that it pops out. And it did. So I got that. But it's impractical to take a rock this big. And uh, I've done that on some other uh, fossils that are on slabs where I've tried to use these tools to make a bigger slab smaller so I can at least carry it. Which is another advantage of that rig I wear. I can put something in the back, you know, to carry it like that. So, other than that, I got a trenching tool in here. Wider chisel, more bags, uh, hammer holder. Uh, I used to wear this all the time, but it turned out it was always empty because I was holding the hammer in my hand, using it to hold onto the hillside. So uh, I took that off because I don't use it that much. I also have in here this type of hammer, a mason's type hammer. These are less practical in the Cincinnati, and the pick kind is better just because of using it for an anchor. This doesn't dig well into the, a soft hillside. But uh, you know, if you're into chipping stones, this might be better. There are a few places, I don't know if you can get these at the museum now or not. They may have these down there. I think there's a rock shop here in town, or you can mail order them. Um, I don't know, about 30 bucks or something, I believe. So, uh, oh, look what else we have. In the bottom, we have a hat. So this, is what, this was my standard fare for a long time. It's a boonie hat. He just set off, uh, and it's, uh, matter of fact, it's finally rotted out because of sweat. Um, what I've done recently, and acquired a dermatologist, has gone to a bigger hat that has a bigger brim to keep more sun off of you. Because this one, you can see this comes clear down in the back, but that one's pretty short. So uh, some kind of a hat is good because of the sun protection and skin cancer smears and all that. The other thing that I find useful, I, even with these, I wear my pants out, but knee pads. Again, the rocks are very sharp. You can crawl around. Even on a hillside, these help. Uh, Caesars Creek or someplace like that that's flat, they're almost indispensable to protect your knees. An even bigger hammer, <laughs> find a bigger rock. Toothbrush, if you have to stay overnight, 
<laughs> Actually, going to do a little field cleaning. Uh, you can touch some things up. It's basically best not to try to clean something in the field. If you think you've got some really neat thing and it's got dirt on it, and you're just not dying to see it. Put it away, take it home, then clean it off. Because I've lost some valuable stuff by trying to clean stuff in the field. Now, if you get to a place where you find something that's rare, in, in Cincinnati, you say there's fossils everywhere. Uh, a lot of times, the beginning collectors will collect slabs. It's like, whoa, there's something really neat on this chunk of rock that big. So your collection ends up being very heavy, taking up a lot of space. Um, Take a little bit of patience. Most everything you see on that slab is found somewhere in the Cincinnati and loose, land loose, without being cemented in a big giant slab of rock. Exceptions to that rule about taking slabs is if you've got a rare fossil, maybe there's a neat trilobite or something on there, or a crinoid, or lots of the other very chyrams, that's when I would take a slab. And uh, if you can lift it, it's best not to try to reduce it in size in the field. If it's too heavy, you kind of have to do that. But um, if you do end up with something really nice on a slab, uh, you need to get made smaller. You can see me, I've got a, a wet diamond saw, I can cut it for you. As long as I fit on the saw, right, Bill? Mm -hmm. Bill? Bill came out one time with a slab, we couldn't even get on the saw, and we still managed to somehow whack it down. That was amazing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so to so protect from uh, breaking your specimens, the, the rule of thumb is, when a rock breaks and you're trying to break it to make it smaller, it always breaks through the fossil you want. So uh, that's uh, something there. Now, sometimes you need one of these, a shovel. Of course, we all surface collect here in Cincinnati. There are a few folks who uh, go to private sites that, that uh, they can dig fossils. Uh, if you're looking for trial bites and you're really serious, you can't go to a public road cut and dig them. Uh, they frown on that. But on private land, you can, and some people do that. Uh, in my opinion, the things that you would dig for would be the kind kinoderms, crinoids, or whatever, uh, and trilobites. Most everything else is just kind of laying out there. So I got this trenching shovel, and if I know that I'm on that kind of a uh, site, um, I'll strap this on that, that rig too, and that's when I carry my little bucket up the hill. I, uh, in doing that, one of my favorite sites over in Indiana, been able to find a stumble on nine different species of crinoids, sea lilies, fossil sea lilies, uh, at one site. And uh, one day I was there, and I was getting tired of walking around, collecting, you know, looking like this. And uh, that, by the way, is not the way to collect fossils. You need to have your face closer to the road cut or, or surface than your butt. You can't look like this and expect to find anything. But as luck would have it. For me, I found it in a big giant slab of rock that had slid down this road cut. It was about that thick. And it had this much shale on it. The shale is what turns into mud. And then the, the shale looked like there was absolutely nothing in it. Nothing at all. Down on the end was, from, from standing up here, it looked like pepper. Just, you know, gritty stuff. So I took some of that gritty stuff home. I got down and used my little hand lens because I had this. And it was echinoderm gritty stuff. Crinoid parts. So I took a little bit of it home, you know, a little bit. Washed that through a screen, a wet screen. And bingo, it was. It was a crime I'd never seen before. And it took me quite a while to identify it, actually. So what I did, uh, I went back to that site, I think probably seven different times with my big white bucket. And every time I went back, I went to that rock, and I dug more of that shit off of that and put it in the bucket. And I took those buckets home. And then over time, I wet screened seven buckets of shale. And uh, I was able to find uh, what amounts to 50 individuals of this particular crinoid. And then uh, once I had identified it, I tried to see if there were any in the, like here at UC or at the museum. Um, I checked Miami. They said they had two. When I went over there, they only had one. Uh, UC had none. Museum down here had none. Ohio State had none. The Field Museum said they had two. Well, they only had one. Um, and theirs were adults, those two, one at Miami, one at the uh, Field Museum. The Smithsonian has the type specimens, and I'm not sure how many they have all together. There's at least two, I can say. But what I had found was 50 juvenile, smaller, smaller ones of this particular type of crinoid. But it was just one of those lucky finds, you know. I've been collecting a long time, I knew there was stuff there, and it was odd that there was this 
grit. And these are really tiny. 